Okay, here is our second graph. Again, I'm about to pop up the graph that I want you to copy down here, and then we will take a look at these terms and get our graph labeled. Okay, go ahead and get this copied in, and if you saw this and you're like, oh my word, or you gasped, that is, I always get a collective, oh wow, whenever I put this up on the screen. But it is okay, this is actually not as crazy as it looks. So again, just remember as you're copying this, I don't want you to get obsessed about matching the number of squares. You just need to have, you know, a tension curve right here. This one has two and then these are kind of going up and they're getting closer together. We kind of flat line here. And then our stimulations, will match kind of one for one. Obviously when you get here, just make sure you have a bunch of stimulations and they are closer together as you move along. The big thing I want you to make note of on this graph is that on that last one, what did we have down here? We had voltage. On this one though, we have time. And so please make note, highlight that, draw an arrow to it. Make sure that you understand that on this graph, we are going to be focusing on time. Okay, so with the second graph, here I'm just kind of showing you um, a reference from the textbook. If you'd like to go back and, and read a little bit more about the definitions we're seeing here. But the point being, for the second one, we are looking at the frequency of stimulations, which is why we have time on the x-axis. So what I'd like you to do is on the bottom, what I often do with my students is just let's arbitrarily pick a voltage. Let's just say every single stimula stimulation or zap is three volts. Okay, so the whole way through, we fixate it on one voltage and we don't change it. The only thing we are changing is basically how many times we send a zap to the muscle. So these two graphs here show you, okay, this is um, a frequency less than 10 stimuli per second. So we're going beep, 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 beep. Here you can see it's beep, 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 right? And so we're, we are essentially increasing the frequency. We have 20 to 50 stimuli per second as opposed to a fixed rate. So as we go through this, I wanna go up here to this term, and this is gonna be the first term that you will label. That very first um, hump or tension peak you see on your graph represents a muscle twitch, and really, all of those are muscle twitches, but I like to use that as a nice kind of single example um, to remind you of these things that take place within a zap. And these are terms that you will come back to in lecture when you talk about the um, physiology behind the contraction of a muscle fiber. And so here a muscle twitch is just made up of three parts. We have the latent period, and the latent period is simply the time between when that stimulus is sent, we zap, and then the muscle starts to contract. And then the contractile period is obviously when the um, muscle fiber is contracting. And then the relaxation period is when the muscle is relaxing. So those are the three parts all together that creates a muscle twitch. So if we were to look at this, Okay, the latent period is just a tiny little sliver right here. Then we have the contractile period and then the relaxation period all together that creates a muscle twitch. Remember, a muscle twitch is really any time a stimulus causes the muscle to contract. Now, when we look at these two stimuli right here, we have one stimulus created this one muscle twitch right here. Now we have two stimuli, but we kind of put them close together. So why do you think it looks this way? What part of the muscle twitch was affected? Well, it wasn't the latent period, and it wasn't the contractile period, but it was the what? The relaxation period. And the relaxation period was cut short. 
we basically sent another stimulus to the muscle before that muscle fiber rested fully. So why does it create a higher tension curve for the second stimulus? As the actin and myosin slide along each other, the entire sarcomere shortens as the Z lines draw closer to the M line. As the sarcomeres in myofibrils contract, the entire muscle fiber will shorten. When muscle fibers contract in unison, a muscle can produce enough force to move the body, allowing you to take notes. Okay, so looking at this image right here, um, these are things that you're going to see a lot of in lecture. Um, we have the sarcomere, which is going to represent this unit, right? And you have the thin filaments, the thick filaments. You'll have to learn about all these bands and zones. But the big picture is, when our muscles are relaxed, or skeletal muscle in particular, we will have this space right here, which is the H zone. Whenever we have a stimulus and that muscle contracts, do you see how things come together and that H zone disappears? Well, every time we have one full contraction, we start off like this, we send the stimulus, and then it contracts, and then it goes back to this. That is what is represented by that muscle twitch. So now looking at the second set of twitches, the ones that build on one another, remember we just said that the relaxation period was affected. So the reason why that second hump is bigger is because the sarcomere was still partially contracted. It was not allowed to relax the whole way, and so that tension builds upon the previous contraction. When we look back at our graph, we can see that not allowing the first contraction to fully relax builds upon that, and that is what we call temporal summation. Temporal refers to time, we have decreased the time, and when we decrease the time between the stimulations, it causes a stronger contraction. So whereas on that last graph we saw, we said that was motor unit summation. The reason why that graph increased was because we had more motor units, we had more voltages saying, hey, more motor units, I need you to contract. Remember here, all of these are the same. We just chose three volts, and so it's three volts. Three volts, three volts. Three, 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 three. Remember, the only thing that's different is how quickly we are sending three volts to that muscle. And so as we follow this tension graph up, the way I want you to think of this is, is when we affect the frequency of stimulation, that's called temporal summation. Now, as this gets higher and higher, we're going to approach an area, uh, this trend is called treppe, and that's a German word that means staircase. And we will come to this part called incomplete tetanus. This part right here is complete tetany or tetanus, and that is when we just have the muscle fully contracted. So back to that chart we saw, that picture I showed just a moment ago, um, that H zone was just completely gone. Um, that muscle is fully contracted, and so we are just developed, we have developed this high fixed contraction here. The incomplete tetanus is what we see just prior to that. All right, so we now have both of our graphs filled in with the terms labeled. When we get to lab, we have a really fun experiment, and um, you'll be able to see in person the difference between increasing the voltage and what that does to create a contraction versus increasing the frequency of stimulation.